I'm excited to hear from Rose about uh, imagining introductory Rust. Uh, great, thank you for the intro. So my name is Rose Bohr, pronouns she, her, ta, uh, from WPI. Um, and actually, you know, my talk, like my paper, it's a little bit off the top of the dome. So I saw Cyrus posting about this workshop on social media and saw, oh, intro, you know, intro Rust is one of the topics. And, you know, my background is um, my PhD, like a lot of very programming languagey foundations. Rust-wise, I used it maybe like a little bit in a research paper. Um, I had a, I have an undergrad who's using it for a project. He thought it was very hard to learn because he started with Ferrite as his way to learn Rust. Um, but I've also done a lot of intro teaching and I've done a lot of intro teaching in languages that are not the most two or two or three most popular in the world. Um, so during my PhD uh, at Carnegie Mellon, you know, I'm, I guess I had been a, a TA for some intro level functional courses for a while and then ran one as the instructor of record. Um, and here at WPI, I'm now this term going to be co-teaching um, kind of a, a first intro level course that's taught for anyone who knows it using sort of the how to design programs um, methodology. So that textbook and kind of the series of beginner languages, BSLs and Racket. So Racket, but not quite Racket. And so as I've been talking to the other instructors for this, you know, as I've been talking to other people here, we're always talking about our intro curriculum, right? And, you know, I think some of the remarks that were kind of in the intro slides lead in really well to what my paper, what my talk is, is about, which is what are some of those barriers we always face almost on like a social level when we're going into academia. And, you know, I think it's one of the things that that deserves a lot of focus is how do we overcome those in, in a good way, in a way that we feel like is scientifically sound. Um, you know, I've, I've met folks who will not be named. Um, it often becomes sort of a point of argument or almost like a, a, a religious feeling of, you know, everyone has their favorite programming language um, and it's my favorite, so I want to use it. Or I use this in my research, so I want to use it. Um, and definitely because both um, standard ML, which I, I taught at CMU and these um, racket toy languages, which I'm teaching at WPI, because these are not one of the most popular languages out there, we often get asked, why are we teaching this language? Why are we teaching this language? And instead of immediately defending that, you know, I tried to treat it like a scientist and say, well, what languages could we teach instead? And, you know, if we're just teaching Python, if we're just teaching C, if we're just teaching C++, again, those are an important part of the ecosystem. They're important to people's careers. But on an intuitive level, we also feel like there's something in their education that's missing if we use that. And, you know, one of the, I think one of the reviews from my paper said, you know, could we also compare against something like OCaml? Um, like, how would that work as an intro language? Um, and I think languages like OCaml, like standard ML, there's certain things in there that you can use them to convey that you couldn't use an unpiped language to convey, right? Um, just this ba very basic idea that you want to know how pipe systems work so they can catch bugs for you. Um, you know, I think if we want to make that part of the core curriculum, part of a part of the message we want people to have with their first computing experience, that makes a lot of sense. But then you get to the, the learning goals section of the course, right? And you have to ask yourself, what are we trying to teach in an intro course? And I think a lot of us don't even know the answer to that question. So I tried to go through, you know, in my paper, what is in the syllabus? Um, what do we think we're trying to teach now? And what do we want to be teaching in the future? So if you look at the actual things that we claim we want to teach an intro level course, a lot of it's really basic things like, you know, can you write a recursive function on numbers, right? Can you deal with a list? Um, can you write some tests? And it's hard to just motivate Rust or Bracket or standard ML or any language if that's all we're looking at as our learning goals, right? Because if you set your learning goals at a, at a low level, well, every language can teach that. And so I then asked myself, what are the things we really want to do? And one of the things to be, not to, to put everyone on a pedestal, like one of the things that brought me to Rust as a community is we're thinking about how diverse my students are. You know, I belong to a couple of you know groups myself, and 
when students learn to program and they're not just looking at their classmates, they're looking things up online, they're looking at, could I get a job using this programming language? Um, there may not be any one programming language community where it's perfectly diverse, perfectly representative, but I do want them to be able to look out there and see a community that's making some efforts at inclusion. You know, communities that have strong code of conduct and actually bring them up during the, the start of the conference. So that is something that's maybe, you know, maybe the, is not on every teacher's front of their mind, but it's something that I think we should all lean into. The other things that I was looking at, you know, I was looking into both departmental research and broader research on what's motivating students, right? Um, one thing that, you know, a lot of us can, can do, a lot of us have schools that participate in the survey called Data Buddies. And I was using that to look into what are students motivated by? And what I found was, yes, they are motivated by jobs. They are motivated, motivated by making money. They're also very motivated to learn the fundamentals of computer science. And so when we're thinking of teaching things, right, you know, we don't, so I do think we should be honest about the jobs part. And the argument I'm trying to make there is when we're preparing someone for the future, we're looking at potential, right? The world is going to change during their degree, like after their degree. Um, that doesn't mean we should teach a programming language that's 50 or 60 years old. It means that, that we should, you know, be optimistic and include languages that have good future growth potential. And Rust right now is at that moment where it's getting that critical mass of, I feel like I could look at what we have now and show it to people and teach it. And I can honestly look to, to other, I could kind of look to future projections and say, yeah, there's a real chance that they're gonna use this in their careers. But also looking at fundamentals, right? Looking at teaching programming. Um, and again, this did come up in the reviews of like, okay, Rust is good for systems things. It's good for type systems things. Um, so, so is there a link to the data buddy survey? So what I wanted, so this is a question that came up. Um, if you look up CRA data buddies, there's a little bit of nationwide statistics. It's not nearly as detailed. The way the system works is that your department at your school would sign up to it and they'd make a special one for your department that only goes to your department. Good question. Um, but if we look at the other side of learning CS fundamentals, I guess we really have to ask ourselves more deeply, what is what is the role of the intro class in the broader curriculum? You know, you may spend most of your time learning these basic things that you could do in any language. But when people come out of this class, what, what I really care about is how are they going to situate that in the rest of their courses? How's that going to fit into the curriculum? I have so many times taught a programming language that felt like it was the odd one out, that it felt like it was so different from everything else they were using. And some students, some students, you know, carry that knowledge on. Some of them do feel like, oh, I learned this and then I forgot it. And then I learned how to program all over again in the next course. And so, although, you know, I think some of us in the, the intro, like there's some concerns over, is Rust syntax too difficult? I think it at least makes an effort, right? It's, it's not using Lisp syntax where it's so viscerally different that people will put it in a different box. And I think what's important is, even if it's not in the foreground, having some continuity with those later concepts, having something that if I'm teaching another class or someone else is teaching another class later on, that they can point back to and they can say, oh, this was something that was foreshadowed in your intro class. So when they move on, it feels like something that's coherent with the rest of what they're doing. Um, I think I can use the next couple of minutes to try and go through some examples of that. So I will finally use that screen sharing. Um, thank you for looking at my face for so long. And so what I did is I took this seven week course that takes basically a section of how to design programs. And I looked through it and I asked if we went through how to design programs um, and tried to take each of these assignments and do a Rust version, what would be the same? What would be the challenges? Where would the Rust community need to do some work? And where can we point to something that we're doing it, but we bring something new to it that would be kind of exciting and fresh for students? So one of the things we start out with in the old course is we start out with a lot of GUI programming. I think this is a really great thing for, for new programs to have something visual, some immediate feedback, some little immediate payoff. So that just in that first week of the class, you say, you know what, I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to, I'm going to check this out some more. Um, I, as a newcomer to the community, I've heard that um, maybe GUIs or something that took a little time or effort to get there, but I think it's getting there. So, you know, keeping, making sure those libraries keep maturing, uh, I think is important. And then if we look at what kind of types, what kind of programming come up, we basically have product types, you know, your structs. Um, 
and we have some types. We have your variants, except we don't even call them that. Um, yeah. Right, and so I actually want to go to, to, so I think, Matthew, I really want to talk about that comment. It's maybe better fit for the conversation, but I, I have lots of thoughts on that, and it's a very good point. Um, so, you know, we go through things that are basically of some types, but the some types are done basically as dynamic types. And so what we're seeing is they're right now going into an untyped language and they're writing their types in their comments. And as they're developing tests, as they're evaluating their correctness, they have to think through types to think through whether this is correct. You know, to know whether their code in Rust in, in Mac is correct, they have to say, is this going to work for all lists, for all structs that look like this? I can't check whether it's a struct, but I have to assume it is. And so if we're already trying to get them to reason in a very type-centric way when they don't have types, just taking that same thing, but now doing it with types gives them an opportunity to see that benefit. Uh, one of the things that I, I lean on heavily in this proposed design is also to try and understand in an intro course, you know, you motivation matters a lot, persistence matters a lot. How do you keep people in the course? And we want to approach types in a way where types are going to feel like they're their friend, not their enemy. And where it doesn't look like a personal failure when they write code that doesn't type check. So one of my recommendations in here is to actually, if you have a lab section in your course, spend some lab time intentionally writing code that doesn't type check and showing them, well, what would happen if you ran this ill-type code? It wouldn't work. Aren't you glad that you didn't write this ill-type code in the code that you submitted? And so trying to really ingrain this idea that it's, it's a natural part of the process, it's not a reflection on them, and that it's something that is meeting their goals, that is helping them write the program that they want to write and helping them do what they want to do in a better way. Um, then as we start getting into things that have like lists and trees towards the end, you know, we can hint a little bit at some of those more systems level features, right? I don't think it's not a, it's not a systems class, so you don't want to go into it too much. But I want to have them have that, that little foreshadowing of things that will come up later. So when they start writing with trees, right? Well, you know, if you have a tree data structure represented with, if you have a mutable tree data structure, you could have multiple ways of representing the same thing. So if I have the same value repeated four times, I could have that with three nodes or with two. And if you're just having them go off of intuition, almost everyone, their intuition will probably be this tree. But you could write functions that tell these two apart and an affine type system like we have in Rust could actually you know, help distinguish this, right? Help make sure you're actually using things once you're not having aliasing in places where you didn't expect it. Um, and seeing their intuition break down and seeing the language kind of reinforce their intuitions, I think that's really helpful for them. Uh, there are some higher order functions. This is again, something where I, I maybe want to, to give them some exposure to how types can be their friends. There's some sentinel values in the old version, seeing how option types can help them on a basic level is good. But again, you know, being being practical about which which aspects we'd want to defer to a later course. So, you know, if you're teaching a higher order type compilation course, you might want to know how you represent closures. If you're in your intro class, you don't want to know how you represent closures at runtime, right? Um, and then maybe just to because I see I'm out of time, um, just very quickly as they get into mutable stuff, there's this assignment about mailboxes, and I think mail and mailboxes can make a very cute metaphor for passing ownership. So having physical objects that are represented into a code that they can then pass around ownership to another data structure. Um, as I dig into it more in the paper, some of those big themes are getting them to view syntax and types as friends, identifying out of our tooling, you know, not needing a huge thing, but what are those few little pieces of tooling, things like one, one click installers that will really show up the most in the intro course um, and, and getting them to view this as something that's relevant and getting it, us to view it as something we could really experiment with, run that first version of the course, do some, edu do some research with CS education researchers as we're teaching our course, test it out in a rigorous way and kind of show other people that it can be done. Um, just looking at the time, I believe that is the, the end um, from, I think that is the, the end. And I guess I can ask the session chair, is it better for me to answer questions as you're transitioning or, is it something we should talk about during the group discussion? Uh, so you've got about four minutes left in your session. So um... okay, I wasn't sure if that was all for for transition. So I'm going to start going to to going through some of the comments, um, just to spark more of the conversation later on. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I think I just wanted to clarify um, for Galileo the question of like, is it helpful to have a transition from unpipe to type in the class? Um, what I was actually thinking about is at the level of redesigning the course. So not a class where they're doing both in the same class, but I have a class that uses an untyped language. And how do we turn that into a class that uses a type language? But the part that I do want to keep is not having them write code in an untyped language, but have them engage with, okay, what are the types doing for me? Right? Because we, we spend so much time talking about a well-typed program. But if you're programming for the first time, your program is going to be ill-typed, right? And so having them actually spend time writing things that have errors and saying, why should this be an error? Why is this an error with the program, not an error with me? Why am I glad that it caught this? So that's what I'm suggesting. Um, not necessarily having a different phase, but explicitly having class time that engages with that and how it would run. Um, and then what else is there in here? Um, I wanted to really go into what Matthew said. Um, because uh, again, on the one side, like one of the, like one of the reasons that I care so much about redoing our intro curriculum is I don't think our current curriculum is that good in terms of diversity of diversity of makeup among the students. Um, you know, it's in particular, I think it was, it was taught to a style, um, that goes so hard on intrinsic motivation, so hard on kind of like rigor, the way a mathematician might think of it. Um, that, that students may feel like they're being told what to do day by day, rather than being reminded, you know, why did I come here? We might have different motivations. Um, I do speak to that a little bit kind of in the intro going into realizing that as intro courses, you know, I think another good thing to remember in the group discussion is that we're not just the first course um, for people that are going to be a CS majors. We're also going to be the only course for a lot of non-majors. We're also going to be the course for a lot of people that makes them decide, do I want to keep this major? Do I want to take on the CS minor? And so having something that can, can highlight, I think you're right, different backgrounds in terms of experience, make it start, start at a level that everyone can get on board for sure, but also show them, you know, some of you might get excited by the mathematical beauty of this language. Others of you might want to do systems. Other of you might want to use it for something else, definitely. Um, and I'm, I'm basically at the cutoff point for the next talk. I think we could spend a whole workshop just talking about that one point. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for all the comments. And I think I'll leave us in transition time.